Welcome back to the World Builders Anvil, episode 131, What to Do with the Leftovers. And no, this is not a Faith Middleton show. Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place that will help prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. Let's sup from the mug of Java and build. Welcome back. As always, I'm Jeffrey W. Ingram. And I'm Michael Miller. And I got distracted today for a couple of reasons. One, my brain is all a fuzz. And two, I would start watching a show yesterday. Um, after Get to the pot roast. <sighs> There's no pot roast. You said leftovers. Yes, and I would never share that kind of leftovers with you. Chop you, suey. But I, I thought we were talking about... Eat it! Pot roast. No. Mashed potatoes? No. Uh, cold pot, pot spaghetti, at least, like pasta? Remember, this is a world builder show. Well, yeah, of course. And we're not talking about food. We could. But food we, well, is actually, my world. We're going to have to do a food episode. So this is it. Leftovers. No. It's in obviously the, not. It, it's in the title. It's exactly leftovers. All right, it's so an HBO so, series. All right, so what are you talking about? Leftovers is an HBO series I only started watching yesterday, and it's been out for two seasons, and I've not seen all of one. And but it interested me from a philosophical standpoint. I'm not completely sold on even watching the whole series at this point. I've watched a couple episodes, but it kind of feels like I'm watching the first episode over and over again. Uh which is okay. Uh, the other fun thing that is, you know, comes into play in, uh, us talking about this is I have watched the entire first season and mm-hmm. I'm going to say, stick with it, watch it. Now we're not going to be talking about the show per se. We're not going to be spoiling anything. So if you're just getting into the show, the leftovers, don't worry about it. We're not going to ruin any details for you. Or Michael won't. I might, but if I do it, it would be on complete accident. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so. The reason Jeff wanted to talk about it is from a philosophical standpoint. Yeah. But before we even get into that, I, I still don't know where you mean from a world builder standpoint. From a world builder standpoint, world building is ultimately, it's it's like storytelling. It's you ask questions and pick at things that interest you, and that's how you develop your world. So the question would be, if you took Earth or your world or any world out there and follow the show's prescription and removed 2% of the world's population on aggregate all on one day, October 14th. I've ruined the whole pilot now. So, so yeah, just to be clear, I, I thought you were going to go – I thought you were going to pr- intro that a little different. Jeff is describing the premise of the show, which mm-hmm. is simply that out of nowhere, 2% of the population vanishes. And so this is hardly your apocalyptic end of a world. This is not fall, which is I think October 23rd. So one quick lesson we can take away, try to rush through October. October seems to be bad for bad events happening. Yeah, buy a helmet that month. Buy, buy a helmet. <laughs> if you get a shelter done, do it for October. <laughs> but the idea is 2% of the world's population literally vanished in front of people's eyes. Now, on Earth, uh, with Christianity, that leads to questions of the rapture immediately for some people. However, uh, we don't want to take away from this thing and saying – it is or is not the rapture. It could be anything. We don't know what's causing it. But the question is, we want to go through a brainstorming process and just say, what are some questions that we come to uh, that could lead us to, you know, A, what caused it? Because obviously, we do something like that where it's not apocalyptical. You're, cre- you're trying to create a mystery type of show or a book or a game. Where did the people go? Um, one bit of housekeeping before we get uh, too thick into it. Uh, I want to apologize to everybody. Um, this episode, 131, was supposed to be part two of the uh, Enter the Stewart game episode, and we will be bringing that. It's just that today was difficult for Jeff and I to do that um, in a real-world standpoint. Like us doing that today is very difficult, so we're giving you a different show. And we're also going to eliminate the tease from each episode. Normally, we would tell you what the next episode is going to be, but we're finding that more often than not lately, we're sometimes having to shoehorn episodes in. Or if something that's uh, timely pops up, we would like to be able to stick an episode to interrupt that. So we're no longer going to be teasing what the next episode will be. 
But and, there will be episodes coming. Of course. And uh, Enter the Stewart will return. We are going to put that out probably in a few weeks or so. Probably. But not as soon as we would have. It would have been today. So 2% of the world disappears. Do you want to talk about this from a standpoint of what if 2% of Garduel disappears? Or do you just want to talk about it from a philosophical standpoint of philosophical, approaching it as a world builder? Like what do you what do? What kind of ideas can we just kind of brainstorm up that could cause it? For stories or from a personal perspective? Uh, from a story perspective, you know. Uh, okay. So so <clears throat> if, if you had an option right now and try and put everything you know out of your mind, which would make it even harder to answer because then you have no answers. Well, yeah, it's, it's also harder because I've already seen the show and what immediately comes to mind, um, that might be a little spoilery, so I won't share. Uh, Basically, of course, you got to imagine that if 2% of the population disappears, some of that 2% are going to be people in that when they vanish, they are in a position where they are responsible for the lives of others. Oh, yes. So that right there creates a tragedy story. Yeah. You know, like let's say it's the bus driver of a school bus and they're going towards a bridge. Well, a bus driver mm -hmm. vanishes and the whole bus full of kids goes off a bridge. Now you've got a not only with – 2% of the people vanishing, you've got a busload of children that all perishes drowning at the bottom of a ravine. Wow. And, well, let me, let me, wow. I'm taking it dark, but, but here's, yeah. here's even the worst thing. Oh my God, it gets better. It gets worse. So you've got all these parents who have lost their children. They want to go to the school or the bus company and they want to be compensated at the very least they've lost their children yeah. in some way they're, they they're, they want to sue somebody but they can't because they the the two percent bus driver having vanished is an act of god the insurance won't cover anything and because everybody on the planet has been affected by this two percent loss of people their tragedy gets lost in the news that's so, actually an interesting thought that you're hitting to and that's something i hadn't quite got to in the show is and, and they do hint upon it a little bit. Is what's the financial ramifications of this event? Um, because obviously, I mean, that's a lot of potential lost in society. Now, uh, uh, it could be my 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 husband vanished, and he was the sole worker in my family. Yeah. We are destitute. We that house is going to be repossessed, but we they won't let us. They won't let us uh, create a death certificate for it because we can't show a body. Yeah. And what if he just ran away? How do we know? Yeah, he really how do we know he's even dead? He might. Maybe he ran away the day the two percent disappeared. We don't know he's yeah. part of the two percent. Be like, I have the outfit. He was standing right here, and then he just vanished. But his clothing is here. But I think you know one unintended consequence the show, at least to date, has not ended up on. So it's really safe when I talk about the show because I have no idea where it's going at this point. And I will neither confirm nor deny, thus not ruining it for you or he anyone else to watch. He might slap me across it. the face, but that's purely for his pleasure. Oh, you're right. That was fun. <laughs> okay. I might have to do that again. <laughs> okay. But, you know, there could be a, a real financial – because let's think that the government's pressure the insurance companies to pay off. You, you could see, like, insurance companies and reinsurance companies and going just going bankrupt. bankrupt yeah. Uh, a lot which, of economic collapse. You know, from a personal standpoint, I wouldn't necessarily miss insurance companies. Me either. But people lose their jobs. It creates an additional pain. And problem to deal with in this beyond mm -hmm. the other productivity has been lost. It, it could have a ripple effect through the economy. Like, I mean, that's just one small aspect. We could go, we could spend an entire episode. Just talk about the ripple effect. Well, yeah. not only, well, it's, well, we're, that's all we're going to talk about is the ripple effect, yeah. but, but just talking about the financial. So if you want to write that kind of fiction, like you could really get into the depths of the red tape that people would have to do to try to compensate for this. But I think. What's obviously for me is going to be always, you know, more interesting the human it is the human story, is the emotional aspect. Like what you've got a family of four, you've got a mother, a father, uh, a daughter and a son. The the two kids are both teenagers and they're so, let's put them close in age. They're both like, say, mm -hmm. 15, 14 and 15. And one of them vanishes. Yeah. Like, what is it like for that family when that one child is now no longer identical there? Identical twins. Oh, there you go. Yeah, because that that has a really much tighter yeah, bond. That's true. Um, or where I would go because I'm slightly evil, or some people have told me so. Well, you write slightly evil. Let's <laughs> let's say that my brain is slightly evil yeah. <laughs> in non actual uh, terms. That makes no sense. Yeah, it makes sense to me. I followed it. <laughs> yeah, because you're my friend and you're insane. and I'm twisted too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where I would take it is you have this husband wife scenario, probably some kids involved. 
take one of them, disappear them, and that is the pure good glue of the family. Oh, I was just going to say something like this, yeah. The person left behind was cheating, was probably planning to leave the spouse at that time. Maybe a little abusive or at least emotionally abusive? Uh, emotionally, definitely. Okay. I, I don't like reaching out quite into physical abuse because mm-hmm. uh, it's something I don't like to visualize in my brain. But, oh. it, could, but it could be for story purposes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but like kind of distant from the children, really distant from the wife. You know, mm-hmm. like I said, actively cheating on her, planning to leave her like probably that night when he got home from work. Mm-hmm. And then being stuck with the guilt of, wait, this person is gone. And then... Re- you know, remembering all of the things they do and become actually almost obsessed with the love that they had lost for that person mm. and probably becoming overly parental for the children who are suffering on their own as well, too. Or or you could you could play devil's advocate and go in the other direction and have them be like, oh, I didn't have to do it. Thank goodness. It saves me the guilt. They've just mm. vanished. It's like my prayers have been answered. They just poofed and went away. <laughs> You know, and now he goes and pursues the, you know, the younger woman who he's, you know, mm-hmm. sort of going after or whatever. Or younger guy, maybe it's the the what? husband that vanishes and it's the wife. It's the wife that does it. Yeah. Or even that is because of, an, of another ripple effect to the person that they were interested in. That person has lost interest in them as well, too. Mm. So now you've lost the person who you had taken for granted, mm-hmm. who had really taken care of your family. You still have the family and the person you were trying to move towards because of all of the events is either gained a conscience because uh, then you, you're sort of built in justification on them suffering from the beginning. The 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 neat thing about – I don't like people suffering in playing stories. Liar. <laughs> he, you are a fiction writer and, and lie. you lie. And I know Especially you're lying right that. now. Yeah, you're definitely lying about that. Might as well call you, call you George R. R. Martin. <laughs> Um, oh, you the, like the, this person, do you? Oh, you like them? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Um, Spoiler alert. The, in- <laughs> the interesting thing about uh, talking about a what-if concept like this one is I-, I find that what it boils down to is the idea of loss and suffering on a human level. Mm. You know, it, when it all comes down to is it how does it in- affect each of your individual characters in a story? And it's it really is almost an apocalypse story because it, it's going to affect so many people. Mm. Like, even, let's say for sake of argument, even a family that is completely unaffected by this 2% loss. Let's yeah. say no one in their family vanished. Let's say no friends or almost nobody they know. Maybe a couple people they knew indirectly or like, oh, you know, the guy who used to bag my groceries, he vanished. Mm. And, you know, there was no one that directly affected it. So for them, it's life as normal, except a couple of people yeah. they might have kind of knew disappeared. Well, then all the people who did lose someone really close to them might be really jealous and probably angry that yeah. why didn't this these people get affected? Why well, why, why did what, I get did I get punished? Yeah, why are you so special? What did God why is God mad at me? Like some people obviously people some people are gonna go that route. Yeah. Like why did God take my son and not touch anything? Like I've been a good person my whole life, but you know, you're kind of a jerk. And let's take a second and go into religion because religion is something that I think would be one of the few things definitely profoundly affected no matter what. Of course. And and a, and, a, can go in both ways. and a lot of people would take a religious standpoint. Yeah, but when something I think, I think so unexplainable, occurs. because when I, the easiest thing to do, and there's an argument called God of the gaps, where people try and fill it in things they don't understand with God. Let and me, maybe it could be. You, you were you were talking about that. Um, uh, I don't know how many episodes ago we had a great discussion about God of the gaps. Mm-hmm. I, what you're saying right now just reminded me of a story my wife told me this morning. There's a, a woman who was in, and I listened to the newscast, like she was had it playing in the other room, so I heard most of it. So a woman ends up, I didn't hear how, hear how the accident occurred, but she's in an SUV and she's in a river and it, the, the vehicle is sinking. And everyone is not understanding why she's not just getting out. And she's calling, literally, she's calling her brother while she's on the phone and the, and the vehicle is now going down. Well, a dude jumped in to go get her. And he, you know, got to the vehicle and, you know, reached through the window. And when he reached her, she grabbed him back. And that gave him a, a sense of hope that, oh, good, she's she's still in it to win it. And he then tried to pull her free and pulled her free. And then 
she almost drowned him because he discovered in that moment, as a, as a few other people was, did, she can't swim. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why she was calling for help, and that's why she didn't get herself out of the car. But they made it to safety. She survived. Everything's fine and good. Now here's the weird part. <laughs> when, when they pulled the vehicle out of the water, all of the windows were up. All the windows were closed. He doesn't know how he pulled her free from the vehicle, and he knows he didn't pull mm. her through the door. Yeah. So... How did she get out and how did a vehicle completely submerged in water that had electronic windows mm. open and close its windows? Yeah. Some people would say that, well, God got her out of the car. Yeah. And who knows? I mean, that's the great question where it comes to that discussion is mm -hmm. people really don't know. Um, I don't think in either way they have their opinions and they have reasons for their opinions and those are all good. But the idea is it's a real strong urge in humans to fill in anything we don't know. And sometimes, you know, like centuries later, you figure something out. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, 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 wait, we rotate the sun? Oh, crap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of times, <laughs> stuff like that. We're not so, the center of the universe? So maybe years and years and years down the road, we understand we why 2% exactly. of the po yeah. population vanished. But right now, we're going with what we have right now. Uh, which is you don't, because that makes it better. Otherwise, it makes it a really lame apocalypse story. Like, oh, my God, I can't get Cheetos because the guy behind the counter is gone. Yeah. Or you can because he's gone. You can just walk out. Yeah, you're too moral. <laughs> <laughs> but back to religion. You know, this the, because it gets I, – I can see where in ways it's strengthened and in ways it's weakened, obviously. Because mm -hmm. like you said, and Mike Neal had some people like, why did God do this to me? Bull, crappy, cocky duty on that. Well – the thing is, That's though, paraphrasing what well, the, the, the idea of putting God there is what could, again, getting back to not knowing the, the source of such an occurrence, how could something so dramatic and so huge happen without God's intervention? 2% yeah. of the, uh, the entire planet vanishes. What could cause that? And, and, since, and since we don't know, we mm -hmm. don't have a logical, technological explana explanation, people would easily blame God mm -hmm. and ask why. But conversely, too, on the other hand, there are explanations pre-created, at least in Christian dogma, of the rapture. Right. This 2% was the number of people who are the true believers who are going up. And people argue differently on what that means, and I'm not a theologian. I won't pretend to uh, want to argue that, but the idea is typically people th think of that as that's like your saintly kind of people. You're real, real good people. The rest of them are going to slug it out in the apocalypse of the world afterwards. So maybe it's that. So I think you have some people going to religions, especially more culty religions at that point, um, because of this idea of, well, that that was God's hand taking them up right before the end. And now the, the, the interesting thing is in leftovers, it's a random selection. And so you sit there and if you weren't, I think, predisposed to believe that you'd I think you'd have more of a tendency against religion than for it in mm. that scenario. But in other scenarios you come up with, it might not be. It could be literally an act of God going, I'm going to screw with this planet. So let's, let's just scoop take up these the people, people who don't deserve it. Yeah. Hmm. I think for me, the more, I mean, the, the, the whole over overall arc of this concept is interesting. So like, if you read the book Good Omens or you read the book World War Z, books that or stories that cover a huge occurrence from a number of different perspectives, mm -hmm. of course, I find that interesting. Of course, I like seeing it from through the eyes of a different, you know, perspective, not just one like a narrator, but all the different characters. Mm -hmm. So like World War Z is a great book for that because World War Z is not a read it front to back book. Every chapter is from a different person's perspective, and they take perspectives from all over the world. They're very, very different characters, which I find very interesting because, of course, the book was written by one person. So when you look at something like this, like the the uh, part of me wants to say, like, oh, it'd be great just to pick one person and just share their their suffering, their their perspective, you know. And obviously, it's for me, it's going to be more interesting if it's somebody who's really deeply and negatively affected by losing 2% and whether that 2% means they lost a child or a parent or, um, all right, <laughs> again, the dark mind in me, here's one for you. Uh, let's say you have a single parent. I'm going to, I'm so, oh, I'm bad. Okay. So you have a couple, they have a kid 
that kid is both uh, physically and mentally challenged, okay? And because of that, the father can't handle it and the father leaves. Mm. So now you have a single mother with a very special needs child that will need care for the rest of their life. And this, you know, child gets to be the point where they're like a teenager. They'll never be fully be able to live on their own or, or maybe not even a group home. Like they're going to have to have mm. some kind of care and that child vanishes. Now See, this m mother, that child has been her every world and her every, you yeah. know, her everything for all that time. But at the same time, there's definitely a degree and maybe a, a shameful spot in the back of her mind that wishes it wasn't so. And now it's no longer so. Mm. so so what do you think I'd run with that for a second? Well, I mean, that kind of leads me into certain sort of similar thoughts where you take it from the child's perspective and it's, you know, uh, the first real memory you have as a toddler-ish age is your father saying, oh, I love you. And like literally having a heart attack right there and dying. And then down a year or two later, you're sitting there and your mom's like, I love you. And she's picking you up to put you into the car. And poof, you fall to the ground. Oh, she vanishes? Yeah. And at the point, so talk about a way to get a character with really screwed up, you know, fear of falling in love. Yeah, right, syndrome, right. You know? I love no, 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 no. Don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> Please don't say that. <laughs> you know, but I, I get it, but don't say it. <laughs> Bad things happen when people say that. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of ways because I, I find that like a story like what you're describing, the story like what I'm describing, I would want to run with that because that, I mean, you've read some of my stuff. You know how, how I, I'm pretty mean to my characters. Yeah. I like it. I do some really emotionally nasty things well, to my characters. Even as a player, you do that. Uh, unlike a lot of people try and build up their characters and level up their characters and power build their characters. And you were always one where you, you didn't mind doing great things in game, but you like screwing with your character too. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I had to laugh because I was, I was listening to some old episodes and I was re listening to the interview you, ha you did with uh, Don Metcalf, who's a good friend of the show. And um, in that <laughs> favorite monster ever, uh, Mutant Lemmings. What's that? Mutant Lemmings. Mutant Lemmings? Yeah, she yeah, yeah. me that book. Uh, she owes you that book. Yeah, she did talk about that in that episode. Um, well, she, you, the question you asked her is, what would you do if you got transported into one of your worlds, into one of your book worlds? Like you became a character in one of the books. And she's like, oh, wow. Well, first, I would not tell anyone my name. <laughs> she's like, I wouldn't want anyone to know my name. She's like, I'd be lying about who I am. And she's like, I would definitely make it a point to make friends fast because my world's going to be dangerous, you know. Yeah. And uh, and I, I thought that was kind of neat because Dawn and I had that conversation one time mm. when we were talking about our characters. And um, and uh, the Dawn and I wrote a project where she wrote a character, I wrote a character, and we wrote a very, very long story with those two characters. And I was very bad, very nasty to this character. And the question was, like, what would you do if you ever met that character? Yeah. And I think that I would have to be very apologetic because I was I'm very sorry. I was very, I mean, I did horrible things to him. I took away his family. I physically tortured him. Mm -hmm. I mentally ran him through the, ran him through the ringer. But because of all that, I thought that it made for a very interesting read. And it certainly made for a, a, a supremely interesting write. Yeah. So selfishly, I loved it. Now, I'm not going to say it's the best piece of fiction, mm -hmm. but I certainly loved doing it. And I think there's something important to that. So for the writers um, that are listening, you don't always have to write something to your readership. Every now and then, write something just for you. I mean, if that, I mean, I think that's a great takeaway. Yeah. Like sometimes you got to write something that you just love. Cause I haven't shared that story with almost anybody i think yeah. dawn and i have read it i think i don't know I, have you ever do you ever read it i think i read parts of it at the beginning yeah and so you didn't you read guys, the two hundred and fifty thousand. no word. i did not read the war yeah Peace yeah Plus. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and one of the things to remember too is and even if you release everything you know if you want to make a living at, at producing stories you do have to sell out to a degree you have to make stuff that will will be popular <laughs> enough to make enough money for you to survive and depending on what your that idea way you, of enough is that way you can keep doing it that way you can keep doing that that's, we, that's what we want for you yeah but 
That doesn't mean all the works have to be. And whether you don't release them or you want to release release a one off, you know, you can do that too. And really famous authors have done that. Mm. And a lot of times they'll use pseudonyms just because they don't want to mix the brand and then they'll go, Oh crap, I could have made so much more money. Let me just switch the name. Mm. Ding. And all of a sudden, well, that's a Stephen King book. I'll buy it. Maybe you've heard of The Running Man, the great Arnold Schwarzenegger movie that was actually a great Stephen Bachman book. Maybe you know the name Stephen King. Richard Bachman. Richard Bachman. <laughs> Richard Bachman. Richard, Richard Bachman, uh, of whom has a number of good books, but The Running Man was uh, was a very popular book. And that was a very interesting book. Yeah, the book was way better than the movie. But that's Stephen King. So That's one of those where I was excited when I first heard they were remaking it. Mm. And then when I saw what they were doing with it, I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to even watch it. Because I did enjoy the first movie, but there was so much they didn't do. The scope was too small. Wait, they remade The Running Man? And do like a, I think a mini series for someone. Yeah. Really, it was really bad. I didn't know that. Yeah. Or maybe I just had it that nightmare because I do that too, and my dreams are very vivid. There are some other approaches you could take if you if you want to answer this question in your world, and it doesn't have to be unknown. I love unknown with mysteries because the thing is, like I said, it's not big enough to be an apocalypse. It will have a stuttering effect on society, and I believe short term stuttering, or do you mean staggering? Both, both. That's why. That's why I was being descriptive by saying stuttering, okay. like, uh, 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 and then go. Gotcha. I do believe that the people, obviously, who directly lose people would be the most affected. Of course, and there are always the people who are possibly over empathetic who would really suffer from it too. But I'm kind of with Michael in thinking. I don't think, especially three, five, ten years after. Uh, it would be there in the minds and people would bring it up and slap people in the face, kind of like 9-11 in the U.S. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't know if it would even be as big as 9-11 because in a way when you have the terrorist attack or the disease or the supernatural things to that you know you can blame, it becomes a call to action against that. When you don't have that, I think it's harder for our minds to hold on to. I think it would be it would go away quicker than even like a 9-11 would. I don't know. That's, uh, that's it's philosophical. I don't know if I'm right thought. there. It's just a. It's just my initial thought. Oh yeah, yeah. You remember that time ten years ago when your brother just vanished? No, I, like I said, there is a core number of people mm. that it would stick around with forever. But I'm saying for society as a whole, because you would have eventually, you would have to just move on. Life goes on. Yeah. That's the one thing that I forget what um, I was reading or watching or what. I, I don't know if it was a movie or or if it was a some sort of autobiographical or. You know, bi- biographical, not autobiographical, mm-hmm. that biographical thing where they were talking about what somebody had died and like the next day and they were talking about their experience of loss to somebody else who had just lost mm-hmm. someone. And they're like, yeah, see, that's the sad thing. It's like, you know, you know, my wife died and the next day people got up and they went to work and they mm-hmm. bought their groceries and the world just kept turning. It was a sunny day the next yeah. day and I was angry. There was, there was no, the world hadn't stopped to acknowledge that this amazing person had left the world and the world won't. And, and don't be stuck into thinking that the anger and the rational irrationality that will follow, the, the, the mental flaws that will follow are necessarily going to be immediate either. I mean, think of watching sporting events and they're like, okay, and you know, quarterback so and so is coming out. Uh, his father blew up earlier this morning, uh, <laughs> but he decided to come out and play anyway. Which, I mean, one, I people who are in professional sports or very small, employed areas probably do not often not show up to work. I mean, it's probably part of the routine that gets them there. Part of that work ethic is what makes them that level. Mm-hmm. But you know, to me, I. Don't know if like, you know, like a parent passed away, how functional I would be for the rest of the day. But let alone the rest but of the day. It year. depends on the circumstances yeah. too. Think about, you know, it's like if you're a soldier overseas and your wife disappears, who's watching your kids, what do you do? You know, mm, and I hadn't, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a I real just good thought one. about, but you're going to start up here in your head and probably as a soldier, you're going to fall back into your training, which is mission first, mm. which is sad to say, but. Maybe after the mission's over, maybe you try and get back, but you have to stay focused on the mission while you're there, or you die there. Or, or potentially or, or, or fail and you know, see rule one, mission first. Yeah. So. That's why there's always the joke. And I think it was actually a saying, but I think of it as a joke, so I forget. In the army, which was safety was being pushed is really, really important. And if you think about it, you're talking about multiple ton vehicles, 
your work gear is meant to kill people. So there, there's a certain level of safety that's very important as being a soldier. But when the army starts pushing, like, oh, we're really all about, we're all about safety here in the army, you know, please put your PT belt on, which is your little ref- reflecting thing while you go for a run. Or now it's like walking around bases. That they're wearing glow in the dark crap, which I find very humorous. I'm sure not if they're in a deployed dangerous spot for being shot. Right. Hopefully. The thing that I found funny is I watched a, a whole documentary on, um, I think it was uh, Apaches and it was talking about um, how just what a savage piece of war machine that mm-hmm. thing is. And you cannot fly an Apache helicopter if you do not have 20-20 vision. They, yeah. will, they will not let you fly it, no, you matter, no, ma- it. no yeah. matter how good of a pilot you are. Mm-hmm. So the pilot in, in it was one time talking. He's like, I think that's one of the dumbest rules on the planet. He's like, because here's the thing. When you fly an Apache helicopter, you are not looking out the window to see how to fly. You're looking at a little screen. So you only need to be able to see two feet <laughs> he's like if you can see those two feet look here's about 2020 you, you can I've fly the better he's pilot. like and yeah. on top of that when you do need to see things and then you go into the night vision he's like so you're looking through the screen now you're looking through a monocle net and night vision he's like by the time you add all those things to, together even somebody with 2020s vision goes down to like 2200 he's mm. like so it doesn't matter how good your vision is yeah. he's like so now you're literally flying one of the most dangerous war machines on the planet one of the most difficult war machines on the planet to, to pilot and you can't see anything <laughs> he's like needing 2020 vision is absolutely ridiculous he's like it's it's absolutely insane which leads me to the quote i was getting to uh from the army when i was in called mission first but safety always uh, oh, 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 be careful when you go sneak behind enemy lines not to trip and fall. Yeah, <laughs> don't trip and fall when you're on Russian soil and we're not their friends right now during the Cold War. <laughs> I'm not supposed to be here, but don't fall over. <laughs> hey, hey, that uh, thing's a two-man lift. <laughs> two-man lift. <laughs> Ingram, don't twist an ankle. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, um, I, I think a couple of things we should say in closing. Yep. Um... Obviously, you don't have to copy the show, The Leftovers, and just say, what if 2% of the population vanished? But I think exploring the idea of what if a big thing blank Mm -hmm. happened in the world you're building and see how it goes, you can come up with some great stories there. Also, on a side note on The Leftovers, I have seen the whole whole first season. It's a great show. Give it a try. And the thing is to remember is really ultimately the job of a world builder is to ask questions to themselves. And even when there's something that I'm, I'm not necessarily interested in delving into myself. Like I'm not planning to deal in a world where you have this large mystery X that happens. I'm not planning to do that, but I still love the exercise of just going through. So Jeff, what's the tease for next week? Mike's a jerky pants. Oh, that's right. No more tease. <laughs> Stop teasing me. Ah, Jeff, one point. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of softball, softball that, that one softball for you. One, yeah. Okay. Because you even warned me that was I did warn nice. you. Okay. Uh, so what's a world builder uh, task? So make up an event. Um, oh, I kind of led right into that. I didn't even yeah. realize that was the task. Yeah, yeah. So make up an event for your world and just war it, game it out. That's what you call these kind of things. And, and just think about it. That's where you come like a lot of the stuff, like the financial, we had no discussion of. I just wrote you could, We things. could go big on that, though. The legality and the financial financial aspects of, of it. Yeah. About this. We could do a 75-part series, I'm sure. because. But I think it. only people like your wife would love it. <laughs> 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 oh, no. He didn't file the TPS report. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but go ahead and make up an event for your world and just work him out. What would happen? How would these unique cultures you've created react in your world to this event from a religious standpoint, from a societal standpoint, from a nation state standpoint? Does it lead to wars? Oh, my son was visiting your kingdom and oh, he just happened to disappear. Oh, yeah, Asian. that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 a good one, too. Um, what's this word ish words or what do you have there? Yeah, I, I know what that is. Okay. So why don't so, you ask me what the real world task is? Then? Well, no, because I asked you what the what the world builder. So you got to ask me, but I need to know what that is to answer. I, I the most the most is that yeah. what that says? Okay. So um, the the real world task is in the event of the leftovers, if it were to happen, 
you'd miss people. So go hug those people. Go hug the people that you love the most that you would miss if they vanished off this world. Let them know that you care about them. And as always, make sure to go to Garduel.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com for the show notes. It'll be under Podcasting, World Builders Anvil. That's a great place to get all of the information from the episode that you've just listened to and to see all the resources that we've talked about in this episode. Thanks for joining us in this episode of the World Builders Anvil. Please be sure to rate and review us in iTunes, and please help get the word out to your friends about our show. And join me, Jeffrey W. Ingram at Garduel.com to see the progress of my world and learn why I made the choices I did. And please contact me and let me know the topics you would love to hear in the future. Now strike while the myth rolls high.